Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of the Way. Pray for us. St. Philip Neri. Pray for us. May the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well. Hi, gang. My name is Charles. <laughs> That's right. And you're a Roman Catholic. Yes, I'm a Roman Catholic. Well, I am indeed. I'll, uh, I'm supposed to go to a wedding in Dublin in June. Oh. Ah, yes. See someone tell you the knot. Irish people do that. And I'm Bill Beersock, and I'm the straight man. That's right. He, uh, he's the, actually, he's the good cop. I'm the bad cop. <laughs> Tonight's topic is Jansenism. J A N S E N I S M. Jansenism. But, <laughs> but, how many here have ever heard that word before? Show of hands. How many here have ever practiced it? Well, we shall see, we shall see. <laughs> First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, and Uncle Bill, uh, here's a question for you. You may have noticed that in certain Catholic circles, there tends to be a kind of a suspicion about interest in things that aren't directly religious. For instance, if you've read a novel, or gone to a movie, or sang a song, or maybe had a glass of wine. It gets, the depravity is endless. Well, very, very often in, shall we say, more traditionally minded Catholic circles, you will see an awful lot of... Disapproval. That's the word I want. Do you know what I mean by... Disapproval. You know. How can you do whatever and call yourself a Catholic? Has anyone here ever experienced this? How can you drink and be a Catholic? <laughs> the way our Lord could, I suppose. <laughs> you know, actually, that's one, one, you know how you know there'll be uh, no teetotalers in heaven? It's because our Lord said at the Last Supper, I will not drink the fruit of the vine again with you until I drink it new in my Father's house. Well, you must be doing that now. Well, indeed, indeed. But the, precisely. But the one thing we know about heaven is that there's wine there. <laughs> So, I, <laughs> I say the same thing every day. And, and there isn't any in hell. Amazing. But, uh, no, you know, you know the sort of attitude I mean. It, it, it's more than just, oh, you're drinking, that's awful. There's a lot more to it. How do I, help me get a handle on it. Well, it, actually, drinking seems to be a focus. You know, if you've ever been out with some trad friends and you order a Bloody Mary oh. or, or a margarita, especially a double, <laughs> right, and you get these looks. Hmm. Well, I like I like the story about you're you're going out with certain trads from a chapel that will go nameless. Now, mind you, Sunday after Sunday, this man had brought uh, bought a round of champagne for all concerned. This was for the breakfast after mass, and everyone, you know, and there was no problem then. Yeah, as long as I was buying the <laughs> champagne, everyone was very happy to to drink champagne, toast to Our Lady, you know, do all this good stuff. But then one fateful morning. One morning, I didn't buy champagne for everybody. I thought maybe now that they were used to it, they'd chip in and buy their own. Well, that didn't happen. Instead, I ordered a Bloody Mary for myself. And the hush that fell around the table was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but one, one old fellow who saw what was going on looks at this, says, I'll have a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's really to have a Bloody Mary in the morning. But you can get a, you can justify a Bloody Mary. That's a morning drink, but... Gin and tonic. No. <laughs> no, no, no. But the, the man was doing guerrilla theater, and I, I approve. Yes. But anyway, I, I think uh, you get the idea that there are, in trad circles, these this kind of cloud that descends on a group when somebody has fun or when somebody says oh yes i listen to rock music or 
you know, I was, at this, or I was at this play the other night, and I went to a dance. <laughs> I've, got, I've got brain waves on my EKG. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, you'll, see, you'll see endless rounds of upset. And the question is, is any of this behavior sinful? Let me put this around. Let me, let me completely reverse the frame of argument. Because we notice something, well, f first and foremost, would everyone here accept the fact that we don't live in a terribly Catholic period? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, all right, fine. Pipe down, Sparky. Um, if we don't live in a very Catholic period, is it safe to assume that having been raised in that period, not to say a product of it ourselves, even some of our own attitudes might not be Catholic? No, not me. I'm, I'm Mr. Super Catholic. Thank you, Charles. But, well, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Proud Catholic. But seriously, the fact of the matter is, is that we all of us, by virtue of having been raised in a, not a, just a non, but an anti-Catholic society, have absorbed certain attitudes from it. So when you want to see whether or not something really is Catholic or not, what do you have to do? You've got to look back. You have to look back, specifically, to the Middle Ages. If the great saints of the Middle Ages could tolerate something, it's not up to the likes of you and me to put it in its place. There are questions coming, right? What? Middle Ages, and what was that word? Saints, the Catholic saints. What did they do? Saints? Well, they prayed a lot, some of them, and a few of them died. I said, anything that they can tolerate. I tolerate. Right. Uh, so, this is a very, very important thing. If you're holier than the saints in your own mind, there's a safe bet you're nothing like. Now, having said this, if we look at our medieval ancestors, we find that, well, we find that we would have found them awfully scandalous in a lot of ways. I think that's safe to say. Mm -hmm. All these folk dances. Maples, Christmas trees. Oh, we do that, so that must be okay. Uh, heavens, what else do they do? They drank a lot. Much more than we do. Huh. They, they sang. They sang. And they had theater all mixed up with their religion. They didn't have secular theater. They had these mystery plays and miracle plays and, and morality plays. They were into theater. Well, of course, at that time, life revolved around the church. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean they were more Catholic than we are, does it? <laughs> How many of our lives revolve around the church? I, I could say that and some of us would like the church to revolve around us. That's the same thing, isn't it? I don't mean, I don't mean just in our heads. I mean, in, in the times we're speaking of, cities revolved around churches. Communities revolved around churches people would spend several lifetimes building a church. And if you climb into the high secret parts of the church, you find detail, careful detail, where somebody carved something that no one sees. Why did he do it? Because it was for God. Right? So, so the church permeated their lives. And in ways, in ways we can't begin to, to fathom. I mean, we're used to, for instance, to thinking of church and state as two completely separate items that have nothing to do with each other. And even if, theoretically, through studying your Catholic political whatnots, even if theoretically you know that's not the way it's supposed to be, it's still hard to realize that, for instance, uh, during Holy Week, all legal business was suspended in Catholic Europe. The courts closed. Uh, and the, uh, at the, on Palm Sunday, the kings of Catholic Europe would pardon uh, a prisoner sentenced to death. The uh, and, and also uh, uh, on the Easter vigil, everyone would put out the fires in their homes. Yes, remember the back then everyone maintained a fire in the home because they didn't just have matches and things. It was it wasn't that easy to, yeah, to start start fires. So they would keep a fire going in every house, but they'd let it go out that night and that that ceremony we still keep but don't many of us don't attend or even know much about 
where the priest lights the fire in the wee hours of the morning, and that, and from that, all the candles are lit. Well, people would also take fire home from that to relight all their cooking fires throughout their homes. So even fact, the fires they cooked with all year long originated from the church. The uh, it's funny, but during the uh, up until the Russian Revolution, they would take the fire from the uh, new fire ceremony in Jerusalem and it would be taken by boat to the port of Odessa in Russia and from there used to light fires all over <laughs> Russia and this this was quite an exciting thing for them but uh, and, and again they, another thing he used to do on the uh, Feast of the Epiphany uh, and this had its parallel in the rest of Europe but I happen to know this particular ceremony the Tsar would go out to the River Neva which is by there by St. Petersburg and they had a big blessing of the River Neva ceremony and the Tsar would drop a cross into it uh, the on Good Friday, the King of England in Catholic days would bless. He would well first he would do what they call creeping to the cross. You know how on Good Friday we go up and we go and we we kiss the cross, right? Boy, you know we're so we're so humble when we do that, aren't we? Except that in the Middle Ages they called it creeping to the cross because they didn't walk over. Genuine. Well, you may remember if you remember the period before uh, the 1955 change in the Holy Rite, we, the Holy Week rites. Up until that time, you genuflected three times going up to the cross. Now you genuflect once. But that threefold genuflection was a memento of the fact that in the Middle Ages, people crawled from wherever they were all the way up to kiss the crucifix. Now in England, before the Reformation, at the time of, uh, well, prior to Henry VIII, on Good Friday, the king, after he had done this, because he did it himself, you say, after he'd done that, he would go and he would bless a bunch of rings who were called cramp rings. They were circulated throughout the country to people who were suffering from cramp, it being believed that the blessing of the king, well, there's an old saying, the hands of a king are the hands of a healer. And the different kings of Europe were resorted to for different cures. The kings of France and England were supposed to be able to cure scrofula. The king of Denmark cured epilepsy. And the king of Castile, Castile, he exorcised demons. Of course, this was at a time when kings were Catholics and were crowned crowned with rites of coronation. And these coronation rites were considered to be like an eighth sacrament. Yes. So in other words, all of society was permeated with the church. Now we grow up today in a society that's permeated with Protestantism. If that. If that. And so we're cut off from all this. We don't really know. We don't, we, even when we just read about it, we can imagine, but we don't really know what it was like to live in a society that was truly Catholic. And, and uh, you can get, there are still places you can go where you can get a bit of a feeling, but it's not the same. Like if you go to Louisiana, remember I was down there Lent about three years ago, I was driving through a town called Homa, Louisiana, and there was a restaurant with a big sign up giving all their fish dishes. And at the top of the fish dishes it said, 12 reasons to dine with us during Lent. Could you imagine a restaurant in LA doing this? And I mean, not that Louisiana, I, I mean, on one level, it's much less Catholic than it was 50 years ago. But still, it's not quite marching to the same drummer as the rest of us. I think a, a point where we don't want to stray from now. Mm. Oh, yes. Is, there was always a point. That's see, we can just revel in, in uh, Catholic history. But in a truly Catholic culture, people enjoyed life. They truly enjoyed life to the fullest. We were trying to remember the lines of Hilaire Belloc's poem, and I don't think we have them perfect, right, right. but... Wherever the Catholic sun doth shine, there's lots of laughter and good red wine. Wherever I go, I find it so. Benedicamus Domino. Uh, the, That's yeah, that, something like some, that. That's some one out. verse out of a whole bunch. But wherever uh, Catholic sun doth shine, laughter and wine. Laughter and, yeah, that's awful. Gosh. Laughter. Laughter, and think of think of so many of the of the folk songs in the ages of faith. I mean, uh, you know the one, the whistling gypsy, where it says, um, "They came at last to a mansion fine down by the river Clady, and there was music and there was wine for the gypsy and his lady." That's the very one. Well, wait a minute. Catholics aren't supposed to laugh. They're not supposed to drink, and God knows they're not supposed to like music unless it's in church. 
And even then, only Panis Angelicus and, uh, and, the Mesa, and the Mass of the Angels. God forbid they should like anything else. Well, there's this thing called Catholic guilt I keep hearing about ah. from, from all my Protestant friends. I always say that's called a sense of conscience, but you wouldn't know. <laughs> Sorry. That's, but that is what I say. Then I'll turn around and say, don't you wish Hitler, who was a fallen away Catholic, had had a sense of Catholic guilt, huh? Then they get really quiet. So are you saying, are we saying, that it's possible to enjoy life and also live a holy life? Yeah. Oh. That's, yeah, that's what we're saying. But Okay, now stop and take a moment. How does that affect you when we say that? Do you feel a little twinge in there somewhere? This sounds a little wrong. It sounds a little off. We're supposed to be dour. Is that a word, dour? Dour, yeah. Dour. We're of supposed to be... He's Italian. They wouldn't know. Oh, Italians wouldn't know. <laughs> no, no, Italians just have a good time. They, they, they can't help they, themselves. But you see, it's because the Italians, like the uh, French, uh, particularly the southern French, I'm ashamed to say, because my people are northern French, you see, uh, have retained more of the Catholic sense of life than, um, shall we say, Catholics elsewhere. And there's a reason for this, and it isn't just because of the Reformation and the bad old Protestants, bad though they were. <coughs> the reason is because of a very special heresy. Oh, no, you don't mean... I do mean... Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Jansenism, that's the one. But first and foremost, what do you mean by heresy? Yes, what is a heresy? Oh, looks like our first plug of the evening yes. is underway. This is an excellent book on the subject of heresy called The Great Heresies by Hilaire Belloc. And uh, the, uh, the, the word heresy is something that we throw around a lot. You're a heretic! But do, we, <laughs> but, but do we really understand what it means? Belloc wrote this in the 20s of this 1920s and uh, he even says on page two we must begin by a definition although definition involves a mental effort and therefore repels <laughs> there's a man who knew human nature <laughs> uh, i'll tell you one thing about belloc is that he's a historian and I, I, of course whenever someone says you should read history everyone goes gag I don't want to read history, it's boring. Belloc isn't boring, mainly because he's thoroughly Catholic and he sees history through Catholic lenses and he has a sense of humor. Yeah. Even in the midst of the great tragedies, he can still see a certain string of the absurd going on, uh, which is probably the glue of our friendship as well. True. Okay, but um, a highly developed sense of the absurd, ladies and gentlemen. But remember, when you live in a society that is completely and wantonly divorced itself from truth, if you don't have a sense of the absurd, you're really going to have a hard time getting along. Because when everything around you is absurd, you really ought to be able to understand that. Okay, what is a heresy? Do tell. Okay, heresy means then the warping of a system by exception, by picking out one part of the structure and implies that the scheme is marred by taking away one part of it, denying one part of it, or leaving the void unfilled or filling it with some new affirmation. Okay, in other words, it isn't the total denial of something. It isn't the total denial of Catholicism. It's basically accepting Catholicism with an exception taking one thing and saying, well, I don't agree with that, or switching something in place of something you don't like. And he gives a for instance here. For instance, let's say a, relig a religion has for one essential part the statement that the individual soul is immortal, that personal conscience survives physical death. Now, if people believe that, they look at the world and themselves in a certain way and go on in a certain way and are people of a certain sort. If they accept, that is, cut out this one doctrine, they may continue to hold all the others. 
but the scheme has changed. The type of life and character and the rest become quite other. The man who is certain that he is going to die for good and all may believe that Jesus of Nazareth was very, was very God of very God, that God is triune, that the incarnation was accompanied by a virgin birth, that bread and wine are transformed by a particular formula. He may recite a great number of Christian prayers and admire and copy chosen Christian exemplars, but he will be quite a different man from a man who takes immortality for granted. Now think about that. If we have someone who accepts everything of the Catholic faith, except has come to the conclusion that death is it. Once you die, that's it. There's no life after death. As soon as you accept something like that, if you make that exception, notice how already, those of you that know the faith, things start unraveling, don't they? Well, what about original sin? What about baptism? Uh, what, what about the, heaven and hell? What about heaven and hell? What about a point? That's the one little, ex <laughs> the one little gap here. The fact that it's a beautiful structure that has no reason for existing. Other than that, it's okay. And this is why the church holds that we have to hold and believe in the entirety of the faith because when you take one pin out, inevitably, things start unraveling around it and before you know it, the whole thing falls apart. It's like during the Arian heresy. Uh, they didn't deny transubstantiation. They denied the divinity of Christ, which meant that the priests were turning the bread and wine of the body and blood of a man, which is a neat trick if you could do it, but why are you bothering? I mean... One, pull out one dogma of the Catholic faith, ladies and gentlemen, and the whole thing becomes drivel. So do you see how critical heresy is? One little pin pulled out of the structure, and the web starts going haywire. Okay, now this particular heresy that we want to talk about tonight. Transcendism. It, uh, well, first and foremost, we have to look, it, it arose, the, under its current name, the late 1600s, in the writings of a bishop called Cornelius Janssens, who was the Bishop of Ypres in Belgium. But before we go and look at what Jansenism taught, I think it's best if we start with what it affirmed, okay. as opposed to what it denied. Now, as you know, particularly those of us who have just come through Lent, those of you who are on other calendars <laughs> won't have this problem, but... Uh, you know that there's a good deal of penance in our religion, an awful lot, and there's a lot of self-denial in our religion. Certain times of the year you fast and abstain from meat. Uh, every Friday you abstain, that's the most obvious. You're often called on to mortify your senses, and that generally means not eating something or not drinking something or not doing something else. Uh, there's, there's a lot of this to it. Uh, to say nothing, I mean, if you talk about self-denial, we're always we're always going on about the martyrs. And there's the ultimate in self-denial, you see. So, the Jansenists took this aspect of our religion and focused in on that alone. Now, the Jansenists believed, basically, they, they were, as it were, Calvinists in Catholic guise. They believed that you were uh, radically evil and in a certain sense unable to affect your salvation one way or the other. They believed that holiness was primarily shown through penance. If you weren't penitential all the time, you weren't holy. Now, this gets into a very, very tricky area. I had, uh, I got a real insight, as it were, into Catholic penance and the spirit in which a Catholic should take penance on the Sharp Pilgrimage. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a long walk from Notre Dame de Paris to Notre Dame de Chartres in France. 60 miles. You got 25 the first day, 20 the second, and 15 the last. It's not, I mean, in some ways it's a pleasant trip. In other ways, it's not. Certainly it isn't physically. It's quite abusive. But I met an old Irishman who, oddly enough, came from Ireland, where they have many of those people. And he um, 
He was in his 70s, and he was sort of a, a uh, professional pilgrimer. Uh, professional pilgrim, I mean, he'd done it all. He'd gone to, to Capo Stela, he'd gone to Loch Derg, you know, crawled up on his knees. He'd done all this stuff. He, he was amazing. So we're talking, and part of the thing was that they'd, at the end of the day, uh, and at each of the stops, they'd hand you red wine. And uh, he said, oh, no, thanks, I've taken the pledge. But I said, oh, so you're a teetotaler. And he said, I am not a teetotaler. And I said, uh, Patrick, excuse me. Now, you tell me you've taken the pledge, but you tell me you're not a teetotaler. How is this? Teetotalism is an evil Protestant notion. <laughs> you see, the difference is this. You take the pledge. Well, it says, when you're a teetotaler, you won't drink because you think it's an evil as though God could make anything anything inanimate that were evil. When you give, take the pledge, you give up a good for a greater good. It's like the difference, Mr. Coulomb, between celibacy and misogyny. Well, you'll admit that women are not evil, at least some of the ladies may. Women are not evil. But... And, and contrary, for those of you who are inclined to be nuns, neither are men. But married life is given up for a greater good, not because it's evil. And that's the difference. It's a subtle difference, but just as you say, one little thing, the whole thing's different. My, uh, my grandmother had a great horror of teetotalers, and... I remember walking past a Methodist church one day with her, because the Methodists are big into teetotaling, or were then, I don't know what they're into now, but they were in those days. So we're walking past, and she looks at the sign, First Methodist Church of Slackjaw, or wherever, and she says, um, ah, they're all in there teetotaling. And I had no idea what teetotaling was, but she made it sound like some disgusting <laughs> practice, you know, kind of like dipping baby sheep into acid or something. Anyway, uh, so this, this is the thing. Penance consists not in denying yourself, like during, during Lent. We don't give up meat because it's evil. We, do it, we give it up precisely because it's good. If you hated meat and thought it was just awful, well, you know what? You wouldn't get any merit from giving it up during Lent. None, not this much. I mean, I give up playing Pinochle in Lent every year, and I've never played it in my life, but my confessor's not impressed. I don't understand. But seriously, though, uh, this, this is a very, very basic thing. But what the Jansenists said was that these things, basically, you wouldn't put it quite that way, but what it came down to was that these things are evil in themselves, and you are good yourself to the degree that you refuse them which is why they had a convent of nuns, uh, of Jansenist nuns. It was called Port Royal. And they used to say about the dear sisters of Port Royal that they were as pure as angels and as proud as devils. Because if you're the sort of individual, I, again, I'll take this, let's say you do feel that meat is an evil, and let's say you've got no particular desire to eat it, and you look around at this world full of meat eaters. Don't forget you're a human being. Look at these meat eaters. Oh, thank God that I am not as other men. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And this was the fruit of Jansenism. But it was more than that. The Jansenists didn't like being involved in anything outside prayer, outside the more obvious works of religion. They didn't like a lot of that either. Being very anti-physical, they weren't very happy with the sacraments. And so it was sort of a, um, a badge of, of holiness among them to receive as infrequently as possible the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, now, the way they said it was, oh, well, we're not good enough. Well, no. And they, uh, because if you read their writings, they take absolute pride in, yes, I haven't had communion in 12 years. You know, <laughs> They must have had an interesting time tackling the subject of marriage. 
They had a very easy time dealing with that. No. They were not very friendly to the whole notion of marriage. Uh, but in this, they reflect very much another group of heretics who flourished in France, in southern France, the Cathars. Now, unlike the Cathars, well, the Jansenists were a bit more Catholic than the Cathars, but they were motivated, as were the Calvinists, and as were the Cathars and the Manichaeans and all these fun people, by a very interesting notion, which comes up over and over and over again in the history of man's religion. Dualism. Has anyone ever heard of that? Dualism? Well, I can explain it in one sentence. Spirit, good, physical, bad. In its purest form, uh, developed by the Persians, it held that there were two gods. The good god created everything spiritual, including our own souls. The bad god created everything physical and caught us in it, captured us in it. And goodness comes from getting as far away from the physical things as possible. Now, in its earlier purer forms, uh, this meant that suicide was a noble act. Child rearing and child begetting was a terrible thing because it was imprisoning some other poor slob. Uh, because remember that these souls are considered to be floating around. They, um, they held that because the flesh is evil, only the most pure people, whom they actually called amongst the Cathars, the perfect, only the most pure people could practice the rigorous moral code they devised for themselves. So the rest, the believers, being sl slaved by their bodies, weren't expected to have any morals at all. Whatever they did was okay, so long as they did, it didn't result in children. Anything else was all right. As you can imagine, this gave them a reputation for sort of unsavory lifestyles, but never mind. They didn't fit it in well enough here. So, that, those were the Cathars. And the funny thing was, to save your soul, that is to say to escape the body and not be reincarnate, you had to uh, die as one of the perfect. Now, as I've said, becoming a perfect meant no, no meat, no uh, marriage, of course, and no, no sex whatsoever, no, not the sort of catting around that was encouraged by the, amongst the believers. Nothing of this. Uh, no, no, nothing to drink but water. It was not a very uh, pleasant lifestyle. So what people would do is they would wait until uh, they were dying to be made members of the perfect. But it sometimes happened that people would recover. And as you can imagine, they weren't as pleased as you might think. I'm dying, I'm dying, make me a perfect. He's made a perfect. You mean, I've got to spend the rest of my life this way? So they had their one sacrament that they believed in. And this was called the consolamentum. And what it was, was smothering the new made perfect to death. So most of these people who might recover were encouraged to commit suicide so as to avoid having to live such a difficult lifestyle. It was quite a, uh, quite a perverse setup. And this is why, when you hear about the Albigensian crusade, and you, uh, and did I mention they weren't very nice people? <laughs> yes, they weren't. Uh, and they, they slaughtered a number of Catholic missionaries and so on, like St. Peter Martyr. Yeah, there's a name you may have heard of. They were, and they were anarchists. They didn't believe in, in government because, of course, government was the devil. And it was irredeemable. Now, of course, those members of the believers who were rulers, well, that was okay. They could do whatever they wanted. But Catholic rulers had to be done away with anyway that they could be. Well, St. Dominic founded the Dominicans, and they had the Albigensian Crusade. Between those two, that was the end of them for a while. But the idea stayed around because it's a natural one. You all know yourself those of you who have ever gone to confession. You know that you've got high aspirations. You know this. You want to be good. And yet, inevitably, you're dragged down. You find yourself confessing the same sins over and over, and a good part of the time, it's old brother ass, as St. Francis called the body, that dragged you down. 
So, the Catholic way, which is, yeah, it's a hard hoe to row and row to hoe around, <laughs> and you've got to, you've got to, uh, you've just got to keep on slugging until you croak. Well, that's work. Whereas the, the dualist approach, well, the body's corrupt and, and I can't do anything about it anyway, so Vegas, here I come. This is the natural response. And so dualism has popped up in many different forms from that time to this. It's interesting that uh, uh, I just, my last word on the Albigenses, but it's, it's sort of interesting. Any of you all ever hear of the singing, singing nun? Well, she, of course, made, was famous with Dominique. Dominique, nika, nika, da, 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 da. Well, there was one verse in there that goes, Dans le temps que Jean Santerre était le roi de langue de terre, Dominique, notre père, combattit les albigeois. Which means, God, you look just like <laughs> I did in first grade. <laughs> Which means, in the time when John Lackland was king of England, Dominic, our father, fought the Albigenses. Combattit les albigeois. Now, when I was getting the song in first grade from Dear Sister Mary Esther, uh, their translation of that, because they'd, they'd, they'd have you sing the song in French, which wasn't difficult for me, but they had a translation in English so the kids would know what they were singing. And the translation they used turned Combatir les Albigeois into uh, uh, fighting sin like anything. <laughs> and I, I said, uh, Sister, that is not what it says here. And, no, sir. Sister, it, it's wrong. <laughs> oh, what do you think it says? Combatir les albigeois. The albigeois, because my father told me when I first heard the song, I asked him. They were uh, heretic, you know, like Methodists. <laughs> and she was very upset. She said, it means fighting said like anything, and they wouldn't put it there. But she knew French, so, you know, I, I, I don't know why she... Anyway, enough for a minute. It's moving right along. So, how does all this trickle down to us today? Funny you should ask. Through two, we, we get it actually as American Catholics. We have it in two different, uh, two different spheres. We get one stream of it comes to us from our culture, which is sort of a decayed Calvinist culture. The Puritans were dualists, really. They believed that anything that was of the body was evil. Only the spirit was good. They believed that they were the perfect and all the rest of the world uh, damned without any chance of ever saving itself. And God showed that they were the perfect because he always let them win. Now, of course, this has given us a little bit of a problem in our national psyche because whenever we lose, we, we don't really know how to deal with it. And when we win, well, of course we won. We're God's own people. What do you expect? The city on the hill and all this kind of thing. Uh, it also comes up in a weird way with separation of church and state. If you want dualism in <laughs> on parade, it's the notion of separation of church and state. But that's one way we get it through our general culture. But we also get it in, mixed in with our Catholicism because the Jansenists were condemned very heavily by the popes. A number of them were excommunicated and otherwise mistreated and abused. <laughs> So they thought. But the heresy, as a heresy, as a conscious thought, was pretty much destroyed. As an attitude, however, it continued. And it continued in France, and it spread to Ireland, because during the penal times in Ireland, the Irish uh, priests, a lot of them, got their training in France and picked it up. It spread to dear old French Canada, uh, Those of you that have been reading True Devotion to Mary, you probably you saw the word Jansenism in there because St. Louis Marie de Montfort was fighting Jansenism in France back in the 1700s. See, his very notion of slavery to Mary was hateful to the Jansenists. It was a, a combination of the spirit and the flesh that they simply couldn't, couldn't stand. But it's all well and good to say you're you're going to give to Our Lady all your spiritual goods. But you say her, your temporal goods as well? Wait a minute now. 
this distinction that they wanted to make that was so un-Catholic. Uh, well, they hated St. Louis Marie de Montfort as a result because he was the opposite of everything he stood for, despite the fact that if you read St. Louis Marie de Montfort, you, say that he, you see that he often demands penances and asceticisms that are more than we'd be willing to give. But it's like that old Irishman on the short pilgrimage. Read it carefully and you'll see he doesn't want you to give up this or that at this or that time because it's evil, but because you're giving it up for a higher good. It's a subtle difference and easy to miss, but it's an important one because like the example that Bellick gave, it's like tossing a pebble in a stream and the ripples go out and out and out. So as a result of the same attitude, I'll give you a concrete example. There were a group at the time, uh, just prior actually, to saint Louis de Montfort in the 17th century, by the name of the Compagnie de Saint-Sacrement, which looks like in English the Company of the Saint Sacrament, the Company of the Blessed Sacrament. Now they, uh, they had a number of people who, of whom you might have heard, uh, Blessed Jean Ollier, who founded the uh, Society of Saint Sulpice, the Sulpicians, Saint Vincent de Paul, you've surely heard of him, and the brother of the king. They were founded by a nobleman, uh, and they were basically around to attempt to transform French society in every aspect. So it was a semi-secret society. If you weren't a member, you wouldn't know who was. But those who were members who had governmental positions took an oath to stamp out heresy in any way they could and to make the government of France more Catholic. Those who were wealthy took a similar promise to uh, deliver alms and so on. Hence, St. Vincent de Paul. Members of the, uh, of the company founded the first uh, hospital in Paris. And the charity hospital. If you've been in New Orleans and you've seen the charity hospital in New Orleans, it's a descendant of that institution in Paris. Uh, and they founded the um, Society of the Foreign Missions, which is still going today and has sent missionaries throughout the Far East and Oceania and other strange places. They did all kinds of things, and almost immediately, they were attacked by guess who? The Jansenists, who were still at that time very powerful in court. Now you could say, why would the Jansenists hate all these good works, particularly when they weren't good works for good works' own sake? I mean, St. Vincent de Paul was not what you would call a, uh, a man who wasn't a man of prayer. It was because they could not stand the notion that the faith, and the reality around us should be affected. You see, this is a much deeper issue, really, than just whether or not you're going to have a drink. That's almost minor. At the root of it, the Jansenist does not want his religion to get outside. That is his problem. And if you are the sort of Catholic who wants to get it outside, he will hate you. More than he'd hate any non-Catholic. Now, fade in, fade out. I said the Jansenists had gone to Ireland. Guess where it came from there? Give that man a green shamrock. <laughs> exactly. He came to the U.S. And here, it found very, very good uh, conditions because the main culture was puritanical anyway, and Calvinism and Jansenism are very, very, very compatible. Uh, it came to a society that wanted to banish religion from the public square anyway, which was fine for the Jansenists. Uh, it, was, it was just a marvelous thing, and the result has been that American Catholicism has always been sort of weak. So traditionally, when American Catholics have got out to do social things or whatever, never as Catholic. This is why, a typical example, again, I love examples, don't you? You all remember the Great Depression of the 1930s? Everyone looks at each other. I don't. I was 12. And I was too young. I would, that's, that, that's, that's my excuse. I wasn't a twinkle in my dad's eye yet. 
my 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 dad had visions of me. He was hospitalized. <laughs> it was very sad. But seriously, the uh, what happened at that time was that the American system came the closest it has ever come to crack it, and as a result, all sorts of ideas were in the air. Now, prior to this, in 1925 and 1929, uh, Pope Pius XI had issued two brilliant encyclicals. The one was called Quas Primas on the Kingship of Christ, and the other was called uh, Quadragesimo Anno, and this was on the reconstruction of society. Now, there were two parts of the same program. What the Pope called for was the reconstruction of modern society along Catholic lines, recognition of Christ the King, first and foremost, of Christ's social rights over every nation. The second part was more specific, had to do with things like reorganizing industry, so that instead of having capital versus labor, you'd have, as it were, guilds or corporations that would encompass both. It's a little bit involved, and maybe someday or other we'll talk about it. But suffice to say that this was kind of a radical program for the day. When it got over here, Catholic social theorists, first thing they dropped was the notion of America being made to recognize Christ the King. That would violate separation of church and state. You can't expect us to put that kind of push that kind of a deal. But everything else in the Pope's program was okay. So Jansenism won its first round. But the second round was, well, we don't want to push this particular stuff as the Catholic program. We'll find non-Catholic allies to help us. There were, in those days, three major groupings of Catholic social people. There were the bishops, uh, well, the, the, the National Catholic Welfare Conference, uh, whose social meister was a fellow called Monsignor John Ryan. It was uh, a fellow you may have heard of, Father Charles E. Coughlin, with the National Union for Social Justice. The thing to remember about Father Coughlin's name is that if you say Coughlin, the person you're talking to pronounces it Coughlin. If you say Coughlin, the person you you're talking to says Coughlin. And you're always wrong. Very important to bear this in mind. Lastly, there was the Catholic worker, uh, headed by a Frenchman called Peter Morin and an ex-socialist called Dorothy Day. Now, if you examine the documents of these three sets together, it looks the same. They were all talking about the same thing. But each of them found non-Catholic allies who agreed with certain segments of the program. Father Coghlan with the corporatist type of people. So he ended up with riffraff like Gerald L.K. Smith and all kinds of sleazy people. Uh, Dorothy Day and uh, Peter Morin, well, they believed that uh, just war was impossible under Catholic teaching, was impossible with modern weapons. So they ended up with all sorts of pacifists. True enough. But then the, these pacifists, of course, when the time came that our major enemy was no longer the evil fascists, but instead the communists, an awful lot of left-wingers and reds and so forth got on that bandwagon, so the Catholic worker went off with them. And Monsignor Ryan and the bishops, they lined up with FDR. <laughs> and so they called Monsignor Ryan the right reverend new dealer. But notice this. All three were all only too happy to hit each other at the behest of their non-Catholic allies. The notion of banding together to save the country and its Catholics on a Catholic basis was impossible. And why? For the same reason, Jansenism. Not as a consciously held heresy, but as an attitude. Attitudes, ladies and gentlemen, are so much harder to correct than conscious things. I mean, if I believe the world is flat, and you come up and you say, Charles, the world is not flat. I can prove this. And you do. And I and you convince me. Okay, the world's round. Fine. All right, you've got that out of the way. But think of all the attitudes I've built up since then about the world being flat. Yeah, you don't stray too far from home, do you? No, well, you don't <laughs> have it to your maps. <laughs> and, you know, I win a, I win a contest uh, that'll take me to Australia. I think I've got to think twice. <laughs> Well, I, do I really... Oh, oh, no, wait a minute. The world is round. I can go there. So, it's the same thing. 
This is the same kind of thing that uh, converts to the faith have always had to go through, is, is to extricate themselves from all the things they believed before and That's somehow right. try to foster Catholic thinking. Uh, in this country, that's not so big a transition because there's not a whole lot of difference between Catholics and Protestants. So the Protestants are better at it because they've been doing it longer. Yeah. <laughs> I think we might want to take a break. We're All right, do we want to do a couple more plugs before we take a break? A couple more plugs? A couple more quick plugs. Then we, we need a coffee break. I need a caffeine injection. You're not the only one, Pally. Okay. Well, all right, let's... Let's but, do a few plugs. But this again, a repeat, The Great Heresies, an absolutely wonderful book, and it's very readable, and it's enjoyable, and it covers five of the greatest heresies. Um, the Arian heresy, the Mohammedan heresy, the Albigensian attack, the Reformation, and the modern phase. Modern being 1920s. But bear in mind that what he talks about in theory here, you've got to enjoy in its flowering. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it, you're living in, in tremendously historical times, and uh, your descendants will read about this and wonder how you managed to make it through. Of course, the way you do too, but they know the ending, you don't. Another book he wrote, which I have to recommend highly to you, is Europe and the Faith. This is an extraordinary book because it talks about really what Europe is. And it's very important that we bear in mind, no matter where we come from and so on, and despite the fact that our Calvinism are, are being Protestant to the very roots in a way that no other country is, despite all that, we are all Europeans in this country. We speak European languages. Our laws are European. We are Europeans. We don't like to admit it, but it's true. We sort of, um, I don't know how to put it, Europeans on a spree. But it's a very important book because it'll tell you something about the culture that you live in, about the culture that's formed you. And he also has a lot to say about England, and that's useful because like, he, he, he deals with the Reformation as England's defection from Europe. Now, along those lines... Two more plug books, and then we'll save the others for after, I guess. But this is a brilliant book. A, his a History of the Protestant Reformation in England and Ireland by William Cobbett. Now, Cobbett was writing in the 1820s, and he himself was a Protestant. He's very funny. He, um, he's a worthwhile writer. Remember what we were saying about history being dull? Mm -hmm. This is Cobbett. Uh, before we proceed further, let us clearly understand the meaning of these words, Catholic, Protestant, uh, and Reformation. Catholic means universal, and the religion which takes this epithet was called universal because all Christian people of every nation acknowledged it to be the only true religion, and because they all acknowledged one and the same head of the church, and this was the Pope, who though he generally resided at Rome, was the head of the church in England and France and Spain, and in short, in every part of the world where the Christian religion was professed. But there came a time when some nations, or rather parts of some nations, cast off the authority of the Pope, and of course no longer acknowledged him as head of the Christian Church. These nations, or parts of nations, declared or protested against the authority of their former head, and also against the doctrines of that church, which until now had been the only Christian church. They therefore called themselves pr protesters or Protestants, and this is now the appellation given to all who are not Catholics. As to the word Reformation, it means an alteration for the better. And it would have been hard indeed if the makers of this great alteration could not have contrived to give it a good name. <laughs> now, now, my friends, a fair and honest inquiry will teach us that this was an alteration greatly for the worse, that the Reformation, as it is called, was engendered in lust, brought forth in hypocrisy and perfidy, and cherished and fed by plunder, devastation, and by rivers of innocent English and Irish blood, and that, as to its more remote consequences, they are, some of them, now before us, in that misery, that beggary, that nakedness, that hunger, that everlasting wrangling and spite, which now stare us in the face and stun our ears at every turn, and which the Reformation has given us in exchange for the ease and happiness and harmony and Christian charity enjoyed so abundantly and for so many ages by our Catholic forefathers. <laughs> what does he mean by this? 
<laughs> I, I, I don't quite that get what he's trying to say. terribly politically incorrect. I'm sorry. I but what's he trying to say? I wish he'd be clear. Yeah. And last of it, at least, and this round of plugs, <laughs> what Cobbett and Bellick do for England, my good friend Solange Hertz does for the <laughs> United States. The Star Spangled Heresy, ladies and gentlemen. And it goes into Jansenism. And Jansenism's part in that great drama of our history. So, one warning though, if you think that Benjamin Franklin should be canonized, he shouldn't. Don't read this book. It'll upset you. <laughs> but but you're going to Rome for the canonization. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's take a coffee break and then we'll come Ten back minutes for more. And we'll reconvene for okay. questions and answers and more plugs. <laughs>